Uh, hello again, a very, very, very warm welcome to the DSU. Uh, welcome to the first lunch bar of Cross-Examined. Um, now, Cross-Examined is a week of events put on um, by the Christian Union here in Durham to really help you to dig deeper into the claims of Jesus for yourself. And over the next five days, we've got a whole multitude of events for you to get your teeth into. Um, these flyers are on your, on your chairs. Why don't you have a look at those? More details about the events we're running there. Um, but as you can see, um, today we're running um, this lunch bar on the topic, Ancient and Unreliable, Isn't the Bible Just a Book of Myths? Um, and coming to speak to us today is Adrian Holloway. So Adrian, why don't you come and join me? Uh, and why don't you just um, very briefly tell us um, a little bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, this is a photo of my wife and kids and uh, married to Julia uh, 15 years ago. I managed to persuade a marine biologist called Julia Brown to marry me. We've had four children. They're called Esther, Bethany, Grace, and Emma. They're 14, 12, 6, and 4. After the first two, I felt a bit overwhelmed, so we had a six-year gap before we had two more. And uh, that's something about me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, for those of you who haven't um, been lucky enough to come to one of our lunch bars before, the format is very simple. We're going to have about a 20-minute talk that Adrian's going to give to us now. Um, then we'll have a question time. So please do keep your questions coming in on that number that's on the screen. We'll ask as many questions of Adrian as we possibly can, and we'll really um, pin him into a corner and get down to the nitty gritty. Um, we're going to break at about 10 two, so you can dash off to lectures, uh, and we will formally end uh, at about quarter past two. So if you possibly can, stay for the whole thing. That would be a really good thing to do. But now I'll hand over to Adrian to help us think about today's question. Isn't the Bible just a book of myths? <clears throat> well, for much of my life, uh, I would have said yes. Like many people, I thought the Bible could not be trusted. I didn't go to church. Uh, I didn't have any friends who did go to church. I wasn't looking for God. I was perfectly happy as I was, and I didn't want to believe a lot of nonsense. I did a history degree here, actually, and then I became a reporter uh, for the Times newspaper in London. And there I was trained to be cynical, trained to disbelieve everything and everyone. I then became a presenter uh, for the BBC, and again we were trained to doubt and to pull apart every source that claimed to be telling the truth. Now perhaps the most amazing claim the Bible makes is that Jesus was and is the unique Son of God. Now that sounded like a myth to me, even as a concept. So let's begin by asking, is what the New Testament says about Jesus supported by evidence outside the Bible? Were there any non-Christians in ancient history who can tell us anything about Jesus? The answer is yes. And I suggest we just have a look at some of these references and then we'll try and assess their significance. So firstly, a non-Christian Jewish first century historian called Josephus says at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous and many people from among, among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples didn't abandon his discipleship, they reported that he'd appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Josephus also makes a second later reference to Jesus when he describes how the death of Jesus' brother James was ordered by the high priest Ananias. He, that is Ananias, convened a meeting of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Okay, what else do we know about Jesus from outside the Bible? Well, the main Roman historian of this period is Tacitus. Tacitus describes how the Emperor Nero was suspected of starting the fire that burnt down Rome in 64 AD. Writing in 115 AD, Tacitus says that Nero blamed the Christians to divert suspicion away from himself. 
Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Now, this confirms that the movement was based upon the worship of a man who had been crucified. To first century people, this was not only bizarre, but it was also ridiculous, because a crucified man was the scum of the earth in Roman society. Pliny the Younger was governor of Bithynia in northwest Turkey, and in around 111 AD, he wrote the following letter to his friend, the emperor Trajan. And in this letter, he refers to some Christians who he has arrested. Pliny is clearly perplexed that they sang verses to an invisible historical person as if this person were a god. And it reads, I've asked them if they are Christians, and if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time with a warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. For whatever the nature of their admission, I'm convinced that their stubbornness and unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. They also declared that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this. They had met regularly before dawn, on a fixed day, to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ, as if to a God, and also to bind themselves by oath, not for any criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. Now, incidentally, if you read the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown wants you to believe that it was only after 325 AD that people started to believe that Jesus was divine. But as we can see here, Pliny has got these Christians in Turkey 200 years earlier in 111 AD worshipping Jesus as God. In fact, in a few minutes we're going to see on the screen documentary evidence that suggests that Christians were worshipping Jesus as God immediately after his resurrection. But first, Lucian of Samosata was a second century Greek humorist. In one of his works, he describes the early followers of Jesus. The Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they're all brothers from the moment they're converted. And they deny the gods of Greece and they worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. And I'll mention just one other anti-Christian source. The earliest part of the Jewish Babylonian Talmud was compiled between 70 and 200 AD. This source is scathing about Jesus in several passages. It calls him a false messiah that he led Israel astray, that he did perform miracles, but that he did it by sorcery. And in a document called Sanhedrin 43a, it confirms that Jesus was executed on the eve of the Passover. Now, there are other documents which we don't have time for now. But just taking the ones we've read, pulling those non-biblical sources together, here is our question. What would we know about Jesus from the ancient world? If we ignored the Bible, well, firstly, Josephus and Lucian say that Jesus was regarded as wise. Second, Pliny, the Talmud, and Lucian imply he was a powerful and honored teacher. So the Talmud indicates that he performed miraculous feats but was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Fourth, Tacitus, Josephus, the Talmud, and Lucian all mention that he was crucified. Tacitus and Josephus say this happened under Pontius Pilate. 
And the Talmud says it was on the eve of the Passover, exactly as the New Testament describes. Fifthly, Josephus has reports of Jesus' resurrection. Sixthly, he says that Jesus' followers believed that he was the Christ or Messiah. And finally, both Pliny and Lucian indicate that Christians worship Jesus as God. So, this is a promising start. There is unbiased support for the Bible's version of events from early non-Christian and even anti-Christian sources. But this just prompts another good question. Hey, haven't the stories in the Bible about Jesus, I mean, haven't they got exaggerated over the years? I mean, they were written down a long time afterwards, weren't they? Well, Jesus died in around 30 AD. And in one of the New Testament books, uh, which is today known as 1 Corinthians, we have an account of the resurrection appearances of Jesus that we can date back to within a few months of the actual event. So in around 55 AD, the author, the Apostle Paul, writes these words. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Now, this passage presents several problems for anyone suggesting that the resurrection appearances are more legendary than they are historical. First of all, writing 25 years after the resurrection, Paul reminds the Corinthians that they can test whether or not the resurrection has any basis in fact, because the majority of the 500 or so witnesses are still alive, and they are willing to be interviewed. But then for a number of technical reasons to do with the actual Greek words used here, and also actual Aramaic words included in this passage, this passage is thought to contain within it a much earlier creedal statement. And it's likely that Paul picked up this list of the resurrection appearances of Jesus shortly after his own conversion in Damascus or later when he takes a trip to Jerusalem to meet with two leaders of the early Christian church called Peter and James. This is a trip sometime around 35 AD. He describes this trip in one of his other letters that we would call Galatians in chapter 1 verses 18 to 19. <clears throat> now, here is the key point. There is wide agreement amongst scholars from all sorts of different backgrounds that this list of resurrection appearances was already well established in the form that it's preserved here on the screen for us when Paul picked it up in around 35 AD. This list was well established in 35 AD. This list already existed before Paul arrived and it was passed on to him. He picked it up in 35 AD. This shows the resurrection appearances are as old as Christianity itself. It shows they're not a much later legendary development. So we have got a very early report of Jesus' resurrection. But if you're looking for the first full-length biography of Jesus, then conservative scholars argue that uh, the first gospel, Mark, was completed in around 60 AD and Luke shortly afterwards. Now, the standard dating of the Gospels in so called liberal circles would be Mark in the 70s, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, John in the 90s. These dates are at one end of the spectrum. But conservative scholars have presented powerful reasons for thinking that Mark's Gospel was written sometime around 60 AD. So, if Jesus died in 30 AD, that would be a time gap of 60 minus 30, a time gap of 30 years. Question, isn't 30 years a very long time gap? Well, not if it's an eyewitness account. When I was a journalist uh, working for national newspapers in central London, we were always waiting for politicians to publish their diaries. Why? Because when they did, we would take their eyewitness first-hand account of what really happened in 10 Downing Street, for example. We would take that as more authoritative 
than the press reports that came out at the time. And we will see in a minute that by ancient standards, the New Testament is written so close to the events that it's like a newsflash. The important thing is that much of the New Testament is the work of eyewitnesses. Matthew and John were two of Jesus' twelve disciples. Peter's gospel, Peter's account, is written by Mark, one of Peter's traveling companions. But Mark is an actor in the New Testament story. We can see Mark in the narrative. While Luke traveled with Paul, Paul was an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. If lots of eyewitnesses trooped into the witness box now, and they each gave an eyewitness account of the same events, we would consider that to be impressive evidence. But many people are totally unaware of any of this. Many people think the New Testament is the product of Chinese whispers. But even if there was accidental or even deliberate exaggeration going on in the years after Jesus' death, but before any of these documents got written down, by and large, the original eyewitnesses were the ones who wrote the New Testament. And they were in a better position than anybody else to write down what actually happened. The Gospels, therefore, are written too early. The Gospels are written before Chinese whispers could have become a factor. Professor A. N. Sherwin-White of St. John's College, Oxford University, studied this question as a Roman historian. He concluded that it takes two full or complete generations for the core truth of historical events to become corrupted by legendary embellishment. According to Dr. Sherwin White, therefore, the Gospels as a result are written too early, too early for accurate historical information about the real Jesus to have become corrupted. But hang on. Even if I did accept, just for the sake of the argument, if I accepted that the eyewitnesses didn't exaggerate, how do we know that we've got today, you know, when we buy a Bible in the bookshop, how do we know we've got an accurate copy of what they originally wrote? I mean, this is just a copy, and the original documents, parchments, whatever, they've all been lost. So during the copying process, all sorts of errors could have crept in. What we're asking here is how can we be sure that the New Testament is free from mistakes, especially when the original parchments have disappeared? The answer is that we can be sure through the science of textual criticism. We can be sure that we've got an accurate copy of the original. And here is why. This table gives us a chance to compare the New Testament to other ancient books which today are considered trustworthy. We don't have the originals of any of these documents in the left-hand column. But before they disappeared, these originals were copied. So what historians do is they look at the time gap between when the original was written. So, for example, you can see that for Tacitus, the original work was written around 100 AD, and the earliest surviving copy. Well, the oldest surviving copy of Tacitus was created in 1100 AD. So that's a time gap of 1100 minus 100, a time gap of 1,000 years. The shorter the time gap between the original document and the earliest surviving copy, the more sure we can be that we have got an accurate copy of the original. Well, as you can see, the New Testament does rather well by comparison. Its various books were written between 49 and 90 AD. The earliest bit of the New Testament anywhere in the entire world is in Manchester. It's part of John's Gospel. It's dated 130 AD. It's in the John Rylands Library. Nobody disputes that dating. Now, 130 AD is only 40 years after John actually wrote his gospel. Now, of course, to you and me, 40 years is a long time. But it is like a photocopy compared to other ancient texts where the gap is anything up to 1,000 years. So the New Testament does well by comparison. That is the first leg of the argument. The second leg of the argument for the reliable transmission of these scriptures is about the vast number of identical surviving copies. If we look at the extreme right-hand column, we can see the more 
identical copies we have, the more certain we can be that what we've got is an accurate copy of what was originally written. So for the New Testament, we have a total of 5,686 Greek manuscripts. These are found all over the ancient world. And it's the similarity between them and, for that matter, the 10,000 Latin manuscripts, a further 8,000 in Ethiopic, Slavic, and Armenian. These mean, when you put all of these together, that we can reconstruct the original New Testament text from all the copies. If you have stacks of ancient copies found all over the world, and you put them all in the same place, and you find that they are all saying essentially the same thing, there cannot have been exaggeration going on, because if there had been exaggeration going on, they would all be saying different things. If all the copies are all saying the same thing, then whoever's been doing the copying must have been copying accurately. With so many early copies from so many places all saying the same thing, we can be sure that the New Testament we have in our hands is an accurate record of what was originally written. Summing up then, Sir Frederick Kenyon, perhaps the world's leading expert on Greek papyri, a former director of the British Museum, he concluded the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written, has now been removed. So it seems that there wasn't corruption of original historical information about Jesus before the New Testament documents got written down or since as original documents have been subsequently copied. Now, if the Bible can be trusted, of course, that is very good news. Because it means there really is a loving God. If the Bible can be trusted, that means that he cares about you. It's the most exciting message that anyone could ever hear. And here's how it was first explained to me, and I shall close with this. Um, there was a, a Christian minister called the Reverend Norman Moss, and he explained the message of this verse, John 3.16, in this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And he explained it like this. Just imagine, he said, that God's somewhere up here, for the sake of the illustration. And let's imagine that we're down here. My right hand is you and me, he said. And let's imagine we're made for a relationship with God, with nothing in the way. That's why we're alive. That's the message of the Bible. But, he said, just imagine that this book represents all sorts of things that I've done wrong, times I've been selfish, times I've sinned against God, put myself first. This comes in between us and God, he said. So he says, when we die, you know, all of us are in this situation. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we die, we, we can't go to heaven when we die. We can't get through. The Bible says the result of the wages of sin is death. So this is the bad news. We're going to perish. But, he said, just imagine my left hand is Jesus of Nazareth. He never had anything separating him from his father, Norman says, until when he died on the cross, Norman says, when all of the sins of everyone who would ever trust in Christ are placed upon him, so he's separated from his father. But, Norman said, hey, look over here. It is enough good news for you and me because it means the barrier has been removed and you can now enter into a relationship with God. And that's what... I did. It was a long, skeptical journey, but in the end, that's what I did. I put my trust and faith in Christ and his death on the cross in my place. And when I began that relationship with God, I can say to you, finally, that was the best thing that has ever happened to me. Thank you for your attention. We're going to take some questions now. Thank you very much. And um, we've got some questions that have come in already. Um, so let's do this question first. Um, Adrian. Um, if the New Testament is so trustworthy and reliable, why don't more people believe it? Uh, if the uh, New Testament is so reliable, why don't more people believe it? Um, well, obviously, many people are unaware that there is any credible basis, any evidential basis for the reliability of the Bible at all. And so if you've seen a Channel 4 documentary and most of the people you know have dismissed the Bible, then it's perhaps understandable that you wouldn't take it seriously. I think we'd also have to say that when you do begin to read the New Testament, there's loads of wonderful messages about the fact that there's a God of love who has a plan for your life and that you can live with him forever. But there are also some demanding mo moments. Jesus does call his disciples to follow him, and there's a cost to that. 
And so sometimes people might not take the Bible seriously because they realize that if they did, there'd be some implications uh, for them. Would anyone like to come back on that from the floor? Or we'll fly into another question. Can yes. you elaborate on those implications? Uh, what are the implications of following Christ? Well, you could say on the, the one level, it means you have to give up everything because Jesus does talk about laying down your life entirely and following him. Now, if everything about that was horrible, then presumably nobody would follow him. Uh, and obviously there are several hundred people, undergraduates in Durham, who have chosen to follow Christ. But yes, yeah, some of the implications would mean that you need to change the way, for example, amongst the dads at school, I would imagine if they were all following Jesus, they might have to alter the way they filled out their self-assessment tax return. Um, that would be one immediate implication. They might have to change the way they live. It might affect the direction of their life. It might affect what they do with their money. It might affect even who they marry. Um, if you're following Jesus, then by implication, you're following after him. You're probably not going there or there or there. And it's like any choice in life. In fact, it's very similar to marriage. That Yes, when I chose to marry Julia Brown, by implication, I was not marrying anybody else. And so that I'm pretty kind of committed over here now, and that's where I'm going. And that's a bit what it's like when you follow Jesus. You choose this wonderful person, but it does mean that some of the other things that you might have done, they aren't going to happen anymore. Thank you. Okay, we'll go into another question that's come in um, on the phone. Um, most people would agree um, that some parts of the Bible, especially the creation accounts, are myths. Uh, if this is the case, how can we believe any of the Bible and trust it to be true? Okay, so uh, a question about the creation accounts being mythical. Um, well, I think that there are at least three different ways that I'm aware of where Christians would interpret the start, the early chapters of the book of Genesis, differently. So there'd be a group of people who would say that the earth is young. They're often called young earth creationists, and they would say that the earth is uh, being created in 24-hour days, six 24-hour days. The earth is only 20 to 30,000 years old. That would be one group of people who would understand Genesis in that way. Another group would say, well, no, actually the earth is... 13.7, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and they uh, might say uh, that the Earth is old and, and not young. Both of these groups uh, would have some commonalities and some differences. Another group would say, no, um, there's been uh, an unbroken chain of uh, evolution between species, that there's been change over time, all Christians would believe that evolution on a small scale has taken place, but on a big scale they'd say, these, these, there are people in our church in central London who would take all three of these views, the young earth creation view, the old earth creation view, and what's called the theistic evolution view. So people who want to take the Bible seriously, people who study the Bible, do interpret the early chapters of the book of Genesis differently. It's possible to genuinely come to different understandings of what the text is saying. It doesn't mean that the Genesis story is of no interest or of no value. It is possible to study it and come to different conclusions. I think that's an important distinction. Someone follow up on that? Yes. So does that mean the Old Testament is technically myths and the New Testament has more um, surrounding evidence to that it is not? Okay, the question is, does that mean the Old Testament is myths but the New Testament has, no, has more surrounding evidence? No, um, that definitely is not the case. And one of the ways we can be absolutely sure of that is simply through studying archaeology. And as you can imagine, there's been an enormous amount of archaeological research over Old Testament sites and New Testament sites. And I think that if you apply the most basic tests of historical reliability, which would be internal contradictions, accuracy of place names, accuracy of archaeological finds, the Old Testament does extremely well. And also, on the transmission of the Old Testament, it does extremely well. So, for example, in 1947, a uh, shepherd boy lost one of his goats in a cave uh, near the Dead Sea in a place called Engedi, threw a stone into a cave hoping the goat would bleat or something. Actually, he heard some pottery smashing. He went up there, he discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. In one of those pots was a copy of the book of Isaiah that was 1,000 years older than any other book of I copy of Isaiah that we had at that time. So all of a sudden we were able to work out whether the book of Isaiah had been altered or changed over a 1,000 year period. And it did extremely well. We found that, there, that essentially there are no differences. Where there are tiny differences, you can actually see them at the bottom of your page. If you buy a copy of the Bible, you can see where there are differences. So 
Our, the, the, the discoveries we found, the archaeological discoveries, have confirmed all sorts of um, details of the Old Testament narrative. I personally would take the Old Testament to be reliable as history, quite apart from my own um, convictions about Christianity being true. Thank you. We'll go to um, another uh, excellent question, probably my favorite question of the day thus far. Um, isn't it possible that the disciples held Jesus in such high esteem that they would purposefully exaggerate accounts of their leader? And um, furthermore, despite the relatively small difference uh, in a copy of the text you presented, isn't it very, very likely that translation accuracy, inaccuracies persist today uh, and the, the word of the Bible cannot be taken to be accurate? Okay, those are two very good questions. On the second of them, I don't think we need to worry because with the virtue of the benefit of having the internet, New Testament scholars are going around with very high resolution photographs photocopying the earliest text that we have. So if anyone in this room is genuinely concerned about whether we have got an accurate English translation of the Greek manuscripts, if you were really keen to discover and to be absolutely sure, you could learn New Testament Greek. In fact, you could do it over there. And after about three years, you could look at all the photographs and then you could write your own translation. It would take you about three or four years to learn the Greek well enough. But once you've done that, you could, by literally going online and viewing the original manuscripts, you could translate it for yourself and then you'd be sure. I have to confess I've forgotten. Oh, the first question was about... Uh, oh, the, 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 the disciples and their... Wouldn't they be likely to exaggerate for uh, their own personal reasons? Okay, well, that's a great question. I think that in the case of the 11 surviving disciples of Jesus... Um, it seems to me that we have a problem with that view, which is that we're sure, we've got lots of reasons for thinking that these, with the exception of John, were martyred for their faith. So they didn't have any financial gain in following this story that this person they were following had risen from the dead. In fact, um, Andrew, for example, when he w was um, martyred, he chose to be uh, crucified upside down to make his death longer. And even on the cross, any of these disciples could have said, oh, cut me down, it was just a story that we invented. Jesus isn't really God, we kind of exaggerated and we invented that bit. He was just like a good moral teacher. So could you please cut me down from the cross because I don't really want to die young, I'd quite like to live. But actually none of them said that. And they kept to the story that they'd seen the physically resurrected Jesus because they knew it was true. So I think when we look at their subsequent lives, we have good reason to think these people were genuine. They genuinely did think that they'd met the resurrected Christ. Um, do you mind if we choose this question? Then we'll come to Is that right? Um, and, uh, the New Testament may record events that happened, but that doesn't make the claims of Jesus to be God true, does it? Uh, that's a very good question, and I totally agree. Um, so, for example... Uh, in John's Gospel, John referred to this particular Paul, and uh, he said it had five porticos, and for probably about a thousand years of scholarship, we had no reason to think that that claim was accurate, and archaeology revealed actually this portico was exact, they were exactly the same as John had described it. So just because archaeological finds confirm the reliability, for example, of Luke's work, Luke wrote two volumes of the New Testament, Luke and Acts, he is particularly meticulous at calling everybody by the right Roman names or giving everybody the right titles. Archaeology has confirmed all his stuff, but it doesn't mean necessarily, therefore, that Jesus is Lord and that he's going to come back and so on and so forth. What it does do, though, is it deals with my initial objection, which is suspecting this is probably a lot of rubbish. If you apply the most basic tests, can he call people by the right names? Does he get his geography right? Does he get his place names right? If an author passes those tests, do, does archaeology confirm the claims that this author is making? I'm more likely to believe the more remarkable stuff about healings and miracles and raisings from the dead. But if he doesn't even pass the initial test, then I'm certainly not even going to consider the more far-fetched claims. But what's striking about the New Testament is how well it does at passing that initial test. And so I am willing to give it a hearing. And that's what I hope all of you guys will do. In fact, you are doing by being here. Um, did you have a question over there that you wanted to, to chip in? Okay, this is a really good question from my right. And he's asking, well, what about 
the other religions, there are other religions, and they also claim that their holy books are reliable. So why would you prefer, for example, the Christian holy books over the books of a another religion? Well, um, when you look at some of these other books, some of them actually do talk about Jesus. So the most obvious one would be the Quran. And there are statements in that book which directly contradict statements, historical statements in the New Testament. So it would be hard to say that they're both equally accurate because the Quran is so adamant about two things concerning the life of Jesus. Number one, that he wasn't crucified. And number two, that he did not die by crucifixion. Now, seeing as the whole of Christianity either stands or falls upon the crucifixion of Christ and that that event really happened, it's going to be quite hard to say that both of those documents, both of which are claiming to be reliable and historically accurate and in fact divinely inspired, that both of them are equally true. So it doesn't mean Christianity is true, it just means that I can't choose both I'm going to have to apply some sort of criteria or test, probably the sort of criteria I'd take with any other historical document in trying to work out, would I trust this source? And then I need to see how these two do and then choose which one I think does best. Now, for a number of reasons, I think the New Testament does extremely well when it comes to testing its historical accuracy compared to that other source that I mentioned. I mean, that would be a very long answer to explain all of that. But I think you ask a great question. There are occasions when we have to just look at all the other tests we'd normally do and come to the best conclusion we can. Um, okay, I'm gonna throw a whole load of questions we've had together. Um, basically, uh, what about the, the Gnostic Gospels? Um, how do we know what, what's a Gospel, what's not? Okay, so this is a great question that many people ask these days. And uh, you may well know that um, partly because of the popularity of Dan Brown's novel, the, the, the Da Vinci Code, it's come much more into public knowledge that there are quite a lot of second and third century documents which aren't included in the Bible. Uh, you won't find them in the New Testament. Uh, what are we going to do with these documents? Many of them were found in 1947 in a place called Nag Hammadi. Now, um, let me just... I've actually got a slide uh, here with a couple of quotes um, this is from the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas, I've chosen this one simply because the Gospel of Thomas is championed as being the earliest of the Gnostic Gospels. But the Gospel of Thomas, just to be clear, is no earlier than 175 AD. We know it can't be any earlier than that because it contains within it some material from a book written by a man called Tatian who tried to harmonize the four Gospels and he wrote his uh, harmony in 175 AD, and this document, the Gospel of Thomas, has got stuff from Tatian's harmony in it, okay? So uh, this would have, this document came into existence around 110, 115 years after Mark wrote his Gospel, so that gives you an idea of the time gap. Interestingly, we discover that Dr. Sherman White's thesis that you actually need two complete generations for the core truth of historical information to become corrupted is more or less exactly what we find in the Gnostic Gospels. So here we find a dramatically different Jesus from the Jesus 110 years previously of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's an example, and I've chosen this because the irony of the Da Vinci Code is that Dan Brown champions the Gospel of Thomas as Jesus being very positive about the role of women, but when you read the Gospel of Thomas, you do wonder whether Dan Brown has ever read the Gospel of Thomas because, for example, Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is an extraordinary religious claim. The only way a woman can get to heaven is by becoming a man. Now this is completely different from the historical gospels. Here's another statement this is actually the, this next slide is the last, uh, towards the end of, um, I beg your pardon, the previous slide was the last statement. Incidentally, the Gospel of Thomas, there's no narrative, it's sayings. There's no action. Jesus doesn't go anywhere or do anything. It's just a series of sayings. Um, <clears throat> if you fast, Jesus says, you will bring sin upon yourselves. If you pray, you'll be condemned. If you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. 
I think you can see that we have a completely different Jesus. So the reason why those Gospels were not contained or included within the New Testament is twofold. Number one reason, they're just too late. They're too late to be considered reliable. Even if the material in the, gospel, in the Gnostic Gospels was very similar to what was in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they still wouldn't have been included because they're just too late. Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John have been, the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been in circulation for at least 100 years before the Gnostic Gospels were written down in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Second reason why they didn't get included is because they just didn't look like they had any connection to the historical Jesus. They looked like they were a completely different later development. And so those are the reasons why those documents, which are still of interest and still of value, and still some of them do cast some light upon some things in the New Testament, but they certainly aren't the same sort of historical information. They aren't as trustworthy as the original Gospels. Thank you very much. Has anyone got a burning question from the floor? Not by the looks of the name. Um, for the sake of argument, I will say that Jesus existed. Now, is it not possible that he was just an average man spreading a word, spreading a word of love, how to live in harmony, um, how to prevent human conflict, etc.? I'm going to choose to say to the questioner, please come back later this week because we have a whole lunch bar on that subject. Um, I suppose theoretically it is possible. But in a very short answer, if we are going to take these seriously as historical documents, we've got to actually look at what's in there. And the Jesus that's in there makes a number of claims that mean the one thing he couldn't be is a good moral teacher. Um, he might possibly be mad. Uh, he might be deranged or deluded. But he, he definitely isn't just a nice teacher. The, the things that he claims are too extraordinary. Don't want to come in there. Um, if Christ is the saviour of the world, why did he not come earlier? That's a really good question. If Christ is the saviour of the world, why did he not come earlier? Well, one answer, which you might find a bit annoying, is because there was a set time which God had ordained, according to an Old Testament book called Daniel. Daniel had made all these predictions whilst in exile in, in uh, you know, centuries before about the particular time when the Messiah would come. Now, there were some pragmatic reasons why it was quite sensible for Christianity to start when it did in the first century. One was that within the Roman Empire, there were extremely good roads. I know that might not be a big deal to us, but it was a very dramatic development in the early centuries, in, in the first century, which meant that Christianity could travel fast. It, everybody spoke the same language. That hadn't really happened before. And most significantly, it was a time of world peace, which meant that Christianity could spread quickly. So if I was God and I wanted to reveal my message to humanity, I would probably have chosen the first century because of the, the, we had the ideal conditions. But the real answer is because there was a set time when God had already decided certain things needed to be fulfilled. And I would say the Jewish Messiah couldn't possibly have come at any other time other than the time that Jesus came because the Jewish Messiah had to fulfill certain Old Testament scriptures which were specific and time-focused, time-related. Now it's to be brave enough to ask, yeah, <coughs> is it not possible that that was sort of made manifest by um, the unrest in Jerusalem at the time and Judea as a whole <coughs> under Roman rule? Would it not be convenient to have that um, prediction, that uh, prophecy, happen actually to people who were being oppressed okay so the question is a good question is he's saying um wouldn't isn't it rather convenient that you had a time of unrest at the time of the prophecies actually that isn't the case the prophecies were sev several hundred years before oh, what i meant was um unrest around the, the first century ad um, yeah, okay, so that's, that, that's a good question. So yes, you could say oh, look, all these people could read the Old Testament scriptures and therefore they might have been expecting the Messiah to come, for example, and there were other messianic pretenders, there's no doubt about it. However, the historical basis for Jesus being the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies, and we are getting, this is another talk later in the week if you really want to hear about all of this, um, then Jesus does win that competition in terms of fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures by miles. He's miles ahead of any, anyone else. So even if what you're saying is true, and it might well be true, I would still say Jesus turns out to be the fulfillment of the 322 Old Testament prophecies, all of which were written at least 400 years before he was born. 
And it is quite extraordinary. And there are even mathematical models where you work out what would be the likelihood of him fulfilling these 50. And people even do tests to see, well, if you had a human being living an average life, how likely would it be by chance he could fulfill two or 10 or 20? And mathematicians do some modeling on that. So we can actually work out the likelihood of there being a Messiah. Um, the New Testament records events in first century Palestine. How is that relevant to the 21st century? Well, that's a good question, and I think at the end of the day, we'd have to say this. If God does exist, clearly I think it's at least possible that he does, that he was the, the first cause that caused the universe to begin to exist, that he was the cause that caused organic life to begin to exist. If it's even possible that God exists, then it would be presumably likely that at some point this God, who went to all this trouble to create the universe and create us, would want to communicate with his creatures. Therefore, there's going to be at some point in human history when presumably this God would take it upon himself to reveal himself. In Christianity, he chooses to do it through this person, Jesus Christ, and to accomplish something amazing, which is that we are separated from God by the wrong things we've done. Christ comes into the world and actually takes the punishment for the wrong things that we've done so that we don't have to, so we can go and live with him forever. A most amazing message of love, a God who dies, a crucified God. Amazing. No other religion is talking like that. And so that happened at a set time in history, and the fact that it did happen when it did means that everybody subsequently who hears this message, even people in this room who hear this message and trust in Christ, can be coming into a relationship with God, even though that historical event, the death of Christ, was around 30 or 33 AD. Essentially, it doesn't matter particularly when it was. What matters is what really happened as a result of it. So it's, inc it's extremely relevant and many people in Durham today are becoming followers of Christ. So for them it is relevant that the fact is there's a God who loves them so much that their sins have been dealt with on the cross, which means they can be free. Okay, we've got um, two or three questions on a similar topic, so I'll try and roll them together. Um, you've persuaded us that the Gospels um, from the first century um, that we've got the text today, they've been reliably transmitted. How do we know that that stuff actually happened in the first place? In particular, um, the guy who was seen three days after Jesus' death might just have been another guy looking similar. Okay, I think on that one, again, I just want to punt on that because we've got a whole talk on the resurrection. There's a wealth of evidence which strongly suggests that Jesus physically rose from the dead. Um, so I'm just imagining it would be better to talk about things we're not going to talk about at another time. Does anyone want to um, throw in another question from the floor? Uh, I'm being, people are waving mad at the back. Yes. I was just wondering, um, why do you think that uh, the arrival of the Messiah, the Savior, came um, at that time, that particular place in the first century of Palestine, rather than, for example, you know, two uh, possible scenarios? Why didn't a Messiah come in the 21st century? Okay, so this question is a very good question, which is why do I think that God would have wanted his Messiah to come in the first century, whereas presumably could, God could have wanted his Messiah to come in 2014, where, as it happens, we have the advantage of the internet and all sorts of other communication advantages. And uh, the answer is that I don't know. So if Christianity is true and God exists, then presumably he can do what he wants. So if he did choose, for his own reasons, to choose to reveal himself in the first century to this particular group of people that he kind of been working with for thousands of years previously, then that would be his gig, his deal. I don't know. However, what I do know is that it seems to me, anyway, that there is sufficient historical evidence to be confident that that individual, Jesus of Nazareth, really was the fulfillment of all those 322 prophecies, some of which are minutely specific. For example, when he is betrayed by his betrayer, Judas, the amount of money 
that was used, the 30 pieces of silver, that was predicted hundreds of years before. Even what happened subsequently to that money was predicted. The fact that there was a spear placed through his side, that wasn't normal procedure at a crucifixion, that was predicted. The, the fact that he came into Jerusalem on a donkey, there's, there's all sorts of details. The fact that they gambled for his clothing as he was on the cross. I mean, they were playing a game at the foot of the cross, the Roman soldiers gambled for his clothing. All sorts of details, the place of his birth, no way Jesus would have been able to organize where he was born. As I say, there are 322 prophecies. Some of them are very specific, and we have got good reasons for thinking that Jesus fulfilled all of those. But you ask a great question, I don't know the answer. Yeah. On, on the, um, <coughs> the cross again, the Gospels are ancient biographies which have very specific genre events. So, for example, the narratives in which your characters are part, they wouldn't be historical narratives which actually occur in those borders, not necessarily even in those places. Um, biographers would take the character and then they would apply specific events to their story in order to illustrate the character of that person for moral instruction or in order to put across an idea of, like, I don't know, like a physical idea or just to make them want to see the person be present. But um, surely then the gospel writers would have deliberately included all these elements in Jesus' life, precisely so that he fulfilled these prophecies so that they could communicate that he was the Jewish Messiah, rather than just recording stuff that he did and then going, in hindsight, oh, look, it matches up. Okay, this is a really good question. I'm not sure I can repeat and summarize for those who didn't hear exactly, but certainly at the start, you were making a really good point about the genre of the Gospels, that they're not biographies like biographies that we would read today. For example, they're not particularly interested in chronology. So, for example, recently, a man called Alistair McGrath has written a biography of C.S. Lewis, and his main interest is getting the chronology right, and he literally follows every single year of C.S. Lewis's life very carefully all the way through. You're absolutely right. The Gospels aren't trying to do that. Particularly, for example, John, the fourth Gospel, he isn't particularly interested in the chronology being exactly right. He's much more interested in choosing, he's selective, but he does tell us that he's being selective. He does tell us that he's picking out certain things that he thinks matter, and he actually tells us at the end he's deliberately left vast amounts of material out. So the Gospels aren't trying to be biographers like we would expect a biography to read with a chronological sequence. That's absolutely right. However, when Luke begins his biography, he does make a very clear statement in the first four verses of chapter one of Luke's gospel that he's really interested in recording real events. He does say that he has methodically traveled around to nail down what actually happened, that he doesn't want to report stories that he does want to report what actually happened. And there's good reason, for example, to think that he found Mary, the mother of Jesus, and got really good information from her because he includes material that other Gospels haven't got. So I do think there's lots of reasons for thinking that the events in the Gospels are real events, but I agree with you absolutely that when we're comparing apples with pears. They're, they're not trying to do a blow-by-blow -blow chronology and they are, they definitely do have an agenda. They do want to bring, particularly John says that his reason for writing is he wants to bring people to a, to a conclusion where they can trust in Christ. So you're right, John in particular does say, you know, these things are written that you may know that Jesus is the, the Messiah and that by believing you can have life in his name. So yes, the purpose of the New Testament writers was to bring people to faith in Christ, but it was all, they were, they were genuinely interested in recording history. And interestingly, they include all sorts of embarrassing details that if they were trying to foist something upon people, like for example, the second part of your question was all about could they have deliberately included all this stuff to, to make it look like Jesus was fulfilling the Messianic scriptures? Well, even if that were true, which I don't think it is, it wouldn't explain why they include all this other embarrassing material that you definitely would never include if you wanted to present an impressive religion. So you'd never have your main spokesman of your new church, in this case Peter, such a flawed character. You'd never have Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He looks weak, he looks pathetic, he looks like he's lost the mission at this point. You'd never include that. You'd never have as your star witnesses to your number one key event, which is the resurrection of your savior, you'd never place women as the first witnesses, not only of the empty tomb, but also of the resurrection, because in the first century, a woman's testimony wasn't even valid in, the, in a court of law. 
And there are numerous incidents reported in the Gospels which you'd never make up if you were contriving a document that you wanted to try and persuade people was true. These embarrassing details, historians think, do bear the hallmarks of authenticity. There's quite a long list of those, and if you're interested, there is a book by a man called J.P. Moreland where he goes through a number of these embarrassing, uh, the, principle, or the criteria of embarrassment. Thank you.